before we dive into this, the, uh, uh, these classes here, they may end up being a little bit shorter simply because they're, they're sectional, okay? And, and it's, it, it's not good, it doesn't work well if you go into this next section. I thought about running a couple of them together, but I kind of got in trouble with a lot of people for doing that on Sunday and flying through all those slides. <laughs> so uh, so I may come back and, and do that stuff. Uh, we have a really cool Sunday. This Sunday, Dr. Tom is going to be here um, with Creation Research. He's going to be sharing this Sunday, so I get to get to sit and listen, which is really nice for a change. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump back into Book of Acts. But I may go back and sort of fill in all those slides that I flew past. I was sharing with a lot of people. They were like, I wish you wouldn't have done that. You know, we really wanted to hear all of this stuff. It was great. And I got to tell you, I was talking with Denny today. I met with Denny. And we had, uh, had lunch and talked about several things that are with the church. And I was uh, sharing with him and, and with Marie as well. When I, when I studied all week long for that, what happened was the Sunday before that, when we were talking about Paul's farewell address to the Ephesians, and, and the idea of, um, of, of people creeping into the church from without and, and, and rising from the middle, um, it was brought up to me after that church and said, you know, you're in a perfect spot here with Paul's farewell address to Ephesus to, to bring in the concept of Islam. How did this all happen? If the church was so established in Paul's day, how did it get to this point? And I thought, you know, that's a really good idea. So I had a blast all week studying, and I had put that study together a long time ago. So I went back and refined it and brought it all down. Well, I kept, it kept growing in slides. It went from like 10 slides to 20 slides to 30 slides. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm getting through this on a, on a Sunday morning. So I was all excited about it. And I thought, just read it. Don't comment. Just read through it. It's pretty self-explanatory. Just get through it. Uh, and so I was all ready to go and all excited about this. And then Saturday night, which is when I sort of, I don't know how you, how you put it together, but in my mind, I sort of bring everything together on Saturday night. I'm usually up late. And then I'm up early Sunday mornings and I come down to the office. And that's where I sort of finalize everything and put it into it's what you see on the, on the PowerPoint in the mornings. That way it's fresh in my mind so I know where I'm going with the slides. So Saturday night, it's, it, it, it was late. Uh, we had gone to the concert. And, uh, uh, and got back and everything. I was trying to settle my mind down and get focused on this. I didn't end up going to bed until about 2 o'clock in the morning. But what happened was, as I'm reading all of this and I, what I had been excited about all week, I'm looking at this at 2 o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking, this is going to be totally boring. No one's going to want to hear all this stuff. So I kind of started to panic and just go, oh my gosh, what have I done? You know, nobody's going to want to hear all this historical stuff. And then I got up Sunday morning and I'm thinking, Lord, should I change? Should I dive back into But I just felt like, no, I needed to do this. And I just thought, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just go through this and all of this. So when I came in Sunday morning, I was really... Uh, I, I really felt like, the, the, you know, pe people are not going to relate to this. You're, 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 you're talking about too much stuff too fast. And it's just, it doesn't, it's, you know, the whole point of this was to draw this thing up. So I did the best I could, and that's why I was flying through those slides when I realized I'd ran myself out of time. And it was because of my introduction. It took like 20 minutes of the day. So you think I'd figured that out, but, I, you know, after all these years, I still make that same dumb mistake. Where he goes, I don't know why your introductions have to be so long. I, I don't either. <laughs> I wish I had an answer for that, but I don't. It just, it just sort of flows. I don't plan the introductions. That's the one thing I don't think about. It just sort of flows. And, but then when I start flowing, that turns in 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And I'm still flowing, and it's like, dude, you gotta, you got to get going here. But anyway, so after the service, I got all that stuff, and I'm flying through the slides, and I'm, in my mind... I'm thinking they're probably going, oh, thank God he's not going to read all of this stuff to us. That's what I was thinking. Everybody's going to be all thankful. No, oh, thank you for not doing all this. But after church, I got hammered by a ton of people that said, we loved this stuff. It made so much sense. We really, you shouldn't have flown through this. And all of a sudden, I'm just going, oh, my gosh. So, so I told Denny today, so I guess I'm going to have to jump back in and sort of fill in those blanks a little bit before we actually get back into the book of Acts. So, so if you're one of those folks... Um, Sorry about that. We'll, we'll get back to it. If you are one of the ones that were like, thank God he got through all that stuff. Sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with it. So anyway, so it's just, uh, yeah, I'm not obviously one of these pastors that has all of this stuff in my brain and it's just all logic. I just, I'm a shoot from the hip guy. I've always been, I've tr I try to be structured. It just doesn't work. It's like trying to wear Marie's shoes. It just doesn't fit for me. So I just find it's just, I just feel better when I just, sort of have something to keep me on track and just kind of wander around with it. I just, I just seem to do better like that. But I've tried to force myself to stay structured. 
you can't put rig and structure in the same sentence. It's just, it just doesn't work. So anyway, so that's what's going on on Sunday. So coming back, coming back to this stuff, it's the same idea. There's so much ground to cover here. And what we're doing, you know, like I said, is I'm, I'm trying to drive this point home that we're to see Jesus throughout this whole thing. That's the point in the whole of the book. And uh, so, so the, the sections, you know, some of them, obviously, the Genesis 1 to 3 was, was a long section. The section tonight is relatively long, but we'll get through it, and we may get through it rather quickly. But I'm, I'm going to have to stop it there. I can't get into the next section because it's, it's a section all its own, and to chop it up, it's just not going to do justice to it. So, so we may get done a little earlier here tonight. <laughs> If I don't do that running on stuff that I was just talking about. No, what did I, what did I call it? Flowing? Whatever. You get the idea. So we're going to jump into this. So, so before we dive in now, we know we understand the whole Genesis 1 to 3 thing now. Or at least, or at least I think we've got a, hopefully a better handle on it. You know, the, the six days of creation. The first three days are that of forming because the earth, the earth is without form and void. So the first three days are forming. The last three days, 4, 5, and 6, are filling what was formed on days 1 to 3. Ultimately, of course, the concept is man. Man is brought into existence by God's design. Um, and unlike any other creature that God created, we alone, uh, including the angel, angel, angels or the, anything within the spiritual realm, we alone are in the image and likeness of God. And we saw how he created Adam and he made this special place and he put Adam in that special place and it's there that he forms the woman and then she is created in his image and likeness and we all know the whole thing about what happened. The, the tree, remember, doesn't represent anything about fruit. What it represents is God's will and their disobedience to God's will. They were free moral beings. They're in his image and likeness and they chose, they just chose badly. And of course, this brought what we call the, the, the curse. We talked about how the, the, the sad portion of the scripture, of course, none of this took God unaware, um, but uh, where it is God that is seeking man out, it is not man. Man, in fact, hides himself because now he's lost his innocence and he's uh, under guilt and shame. And then we talked about how they were set outside the, the garden as an act of grace, not an act of judgment. It really bugs me when people uh, say this stuff that God was, you know, he kicked them out of Eden. He did not kick them out of Eden. He separated them from Eden to, to, uh, as an act of grace because had they locked themselves in the tree of life in that condition, they would have been locked into the sin nature forever without a remedy. So, so by God removing them from the garden and putting the angel there to not allow them entrance back in, that was an act of grace, not an act of judgment. Okay? And it's there, of course, where he, the, the leaves that they had tried to cover themselves with were unsatisfactory. Um, they're not going to cut it. Your, their efforts were not going to be able to cover their shame and their guilt. And so God covers them with the skins of animals. So there we have the first picture uh, of redemption, that uh, the innocent dies for the guilty. Um, an innocent animal that did nothing wrong had to shed its blood to cover them. This is the concept of atonement. Um, atonement means to cover. And so the atonement is introduced there. Um, and Adam and Eve's sin is covered by the skin of this. And then, of course, the promise, the first messianic promise in the scripture, the, the seed of the woman, of course, pointing to Christ. So, you know, if there's going to be atonement and therefore redemption, then there has to be a redeemer. And the redeemer is introduced as the seed of the woman. And, of course, then judgment is passed on the serpent, right? Um, and now Adam and Eve, though, are now in a completely different scenario than they were in prior to the fall. They're now uh, in a relationship being separated from God. Now, there's a gap that exists between them because of sin, all right? So that's kind of where we find themselves, or, or we find them at. We find ourselves there. So this is what we're going to look at tonight. So now we're going to see Adam's sons in his image. And, and I pointed this out. Uh, touched on this briefly. This is, uh, you know, one of those, and I say this all the time, but this is one of those really tragic verses where Adam and Eve were created in the image and likeness of God. We're going to see that um, uh, that uh, uh, their their uh, uh, procreation, their kids, are going to carry their image, which of course now is a fallen image, which is of course the initiation of the sin nature that Paul deals with in the New Testament and Jesus talked about enough. But this is the origins of all of that. So in Genesis chapter 4 now, so we're one chapter now removed from the fall. Everything is outside the garden. So now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now this is not in your notes because at the time I wasn't really focusing on this. So this is just sort of uh, something to uh, for you to understand. I won't break this all down for you because it gets lengthy. But what's, what's actually being 
being said here in the original language is remember that God had said to her that it would be one of her seed that would crush the head of the serpent. This phrase that you see in English, I have acquired a man from the Lord, means it's written in such a way that Eve thought the birth of Cain was the promised seed. She thought he was the answer. He was the one that was going to crush the, the serpent's head. It doesn't appear in the English to be that way, but that's very clearly what she understood. I have a man. He's the one that he talked about, which is going to crush the head of the serpent and set all things right. She thought it was going to be Cain. Well, we know the story of Cain. We're going to be talking about it even more in detail here tonight. But, but obviously Cain was anything but. Okay, She could have said that about it anyway. It could have been Abel or Abel. Right? But either way, but that's the way it's written, and I wanted to point, point this out. Um, so I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Um, now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but in contrast to that, Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, uh, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Okay? But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Hebrew translation, he got the case of droopy lip. He was all pouty. That's what's being described here, okay? So the Lord, asked, or the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry, and why has your countenance fallen? Okay, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you, do, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should, should rule over it. So what we're seeing here now is, again, so much for this idea uh, that, that uh, you know, God sovereignly picked who was going to... Obviously, Cain has an opportunity here to do differently than it turns out that he did. He's given that opportunity. Whereas, you know, if, if it's true that God sovereignly appointed Cain to this position, then God is deceptive, to say the least. Because he's saying to Cain, don't you understand that if you do the right thing, things are going to do well. If you don't do the right thing, things are going to go really, really bad. So Cain has a choice. It's as simple as that. To me, it's, it's a no-brainer. And when I get into discussions with these guys that want to talk about all of this stuff, that, that they, they just miss this point. And it's just, it's tragic to me. If you, you know, if it starts at the beginning, this is where we are. Adam and Eve added, don't do this. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. The tree, right? You're going to separate yourself from it. So ever since man and God have been in a relationship, even in a fallen relationship, man has always had choices. And God very clearly makes those choices obvious. Don't do this. If you don't, if you do, this is what will occur. It's the same thing here. Secondly, notice that uh, if you do not well, sin lies at the door. Now look at the rest of the verse there in verse 7. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So sin becomes personal here. It's not a thing to be done. It's a thing that desires to have. Okay? So sin is personified here. In other words, what I'm trying to say. Because it's, it's the, sort of the nature of the beast, right? So, so, so it's not, it, sin doesn't, is, here is this, this, not this concept of things that are done wrong, but of this thing that wants to devour. The New Testament equivalent of that is Peter saying, look, your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can, desire, whom he can devour, right? But notice what is said here. They're outside the garden after the fall. Its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. They still had the dominion mandate present. Even though they were in a fallen condition, Adam and Eve. If he's going to say this to Cain, obviously it would apply to Adam and Eve. It would apply to Abel as well. There was still this mandate principle in there. You can rule over this. You can conquer this. All right. Again, a choice. Of course, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. It came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Now, we're all familiar with the story. But what we need to stop and think about, and I'm going to be talking about some of this is already in the points. I always say read the points and then talk about this. But keep in mind, what has happened here is obviously these boys have grown to manhood. Okay? We're not talking about kids here. Which tells us, that both Cain and Abel, let's assume they're 30 years old. There's no way to know that. I'm just putting a number on it so it's easier for us to understand. That means for 30 years, for 29 years, sorry, for 29 years, Cain 
either didn't have a problem or at least never voiced a problem with coming before God with an offering of, of a sheep, something alive. Something has changed, okay? Obviously, he brings, as we just read in the verses previous to this, he brings the fruit of his hands. So at some point in Cain's life, he had decided, let's say from 29 to 30 years of, 30 years of age, he had decided he was no longer going to do it God's way. Folks, that is the issue with the whole Cain and Abel story. That is the heart of, the, of what the problem is and what we need to understand from this. It isn't just about Cain killing Abel. It's what caused Cain to get to the point where he was no longer going to offer to God what God had clearly shown him to offer. Second thing is, how did they know how to do that? How did they know for 29 years what to do? Well, obviously, Adam and Eve had passed it on to them. Adam and Eve had learned what redemption required. It required atonement. Atonement can't, be, can't, be taken, can't take place without the sacrifice of, a, of, a, of a, something that has the breath of life in it, in particular, obviously, an animal, which no doubt was the lamb. So all of these years, they all knew this, and it had been passed on from Adam and Eve to Cain and Abel. Now we know there were brothers and sisters, though we're not told them, they're not pertinent to the story, but we do know that these guys married their sisters. We're just going to have to get over it and quit looking at it from a 2016 Western perspective, all right? Because we always do that. Well, how come they didn't produce kids with three heads? You know, uh, how come they didn't look like some of the people in the deep south, you know, no teeth and all of that kind of stuff. Well, that's because you're missing the whole concept of the genetics. At this time, the gene pool was, was just one step removed from being pure, right? So, but what's happening here is the whole concept of what was that in Cain that had, he had, that had brought him to the point to where he had decided, I'm no longer going to do it God's way. I know what God says he'll accept, but I'm going to do it my way, and God will accept me. And of course, that's not going to happen. So, so these are the things that you wrestle with when you come to passages like this. Okay? So you can see there. So Adam and Eve would have understood the need for a living sacrifice to atone for, of course, that is to cover, their guilt and their shame. This means that they would have understood God's plan of redemption. Now, they may not have called it redemption, they may not have had the, the, the systematic theology to identify all of this stuff, but they understood what it was that God required. So they understood God's plan of redemption um, through that sacrifice to reconcile. To reconcile means to restore fellowship, okay? To reconcile themselves with God. They would have passed this belief on to their sons, Cain and Abel. And of course, that's what we've been talking about. So here's a comparison of the two side by side as you move through this, and this is the stuff going back to the, the, the concept that I was talking about. Yes, sir? That say living blood sacrifice? What's that? In your notes? Uh-huh. It yeah, it's going to start, it's going to say that as we move forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you're going to see right here where we're starting to head, it's going to be coming on. So here's a comparison. Now notice that the two, we already know this, Cain is a farmer, Abel is a shepherd. You know, farmers, they plant, they water, they harvest, shepherds protect, pro provide and protect. Plants and vegetables have no breath of life in them, okay? All right? And sheep, but sheep obviously do have the breath of life in them. So their souls, their living souls, they just, you know, they're, they're not like us, but anyway. So Cain brings a sacrifice that has no breath of life in it, but the Abel does bring. Now remember, Cain had done this, he had been in the right column, even though his occupation was different. He had done everything in the right column until that 30th year. So we don't know what happened, but whatever it brought. It. So he brings a sacrifice that has no breath of life in it. And, but, but Abel brings a sacrifice that has breath of life. He also brings a sacrifice that has no blood of atonement in it. Okay? That's the problem with Cain's offering. Well, part of the problem. So, but obviously, Abel brings a sacrifice that has not only the breath of life in it, but the blood of atonement. So, in Cain's tale, this is a sacrifice of self-effort, all right? For, for the shepherd, Abel, this is a sacrifice without self-effort. This is a sacrifice of the work of Cain's hands. In other words, he's bringing to God what he has done, whereas an animal brought, other than keeping care of it, it's, it's growing on its own. So, this is a sacrifice without the work of Abel's hands. So, so this is just sort of a comparative thing. Now again, 
We don't know what changed, what happened, but whatever reason, Cain had gotten to the point to where he determined that he was no longer going to follow the plan of redemption. And therein lies the issue, okay? So from Cain, this is continuing on in that chart, this is the definition of religion. It's as simple as that. There's no two ways about it. Um, whereas from the Abel side, this is redemption. Religion and redemption are always at odds with one another. Religion, notice, works towards God on its own terms. I will do it my way. That's what religion does. Whereas redemption comes from God on his terms, I will do it God's way. There's a huge difference between the two. All right? Religion depends on getting to God, making efforts and working towards God. We're going to see in another chart here in a minute. Redemption depends on God coming to us. Religion, this is unacceptable to God and will be rejected by him, whereas redemption is acceptable and will be received. Okay? The religious will always hate the redeemed. Who is it, when you think of world history, throughout the history of the world, and I'm talking as far back as you want to go, who is always slaughtering who? It's always the religious that are going after the redeemed. Always, without fail. Over and over and over again. Because religion cannot tolerate redemption. Because redemption requires nothing except faith and belief. Religion requires all of the other stuff, right? The religious will murder for what they believe, and this is, uh, really works with, in particular with uh, religion like Islam. The, uh, the religious will murder for what they believe. You will die for what I believe, whereas the redeemed will be martyred for what they believe. I will die for what I believe. Sin separates religion, separates from God. Our efforts are never going to reach God, whereas faith restores. So what you've got here is this, this great contrast. Because religion, and let's just look at it within the framework of, of what we understand today. Religion still has this problem. It, it still does. Religion is a set of rules and traditions and ceremonies that are supposed to make one or get one closer to God, right? I mean, you say these set, these set of prayers, and this is any religion, I'm not picking on anyone in particular. You say this particular prayers, you can only sing these songs, you have to read these prayers, right? Uh, you, you have to, you can't, you can't dress like this, you can't, you know, it just goes on and on and on. And by keeping, you know, this set of rules and these traditions and these ceremonies, this is what brings one closer to God. Now, you could put any religion you want to put in that category. I don't care which one you want to pick. Sadly, you could even put some Christian denominations in that because they do the same thing. But when you come to redemption, none of those matter. They're all irrelevant. The only thing that matters is what God has done for us and embracing that. And by embracing that, putting that to practice in our lives, and as the scripture teaches us, as we draw near to God, God not draws near to us, right? But it's all not, it's all, it, none of it is done based on our merit. This was the problem the Jews had in Judaism with the law. They had turned the law from being the point of redemption, which it's clearly doing, and, not, and I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments, I'm talking the broader concept of law, um, but they... They, they were doing that and they got so focused on what we call the letter of the law that they failed to see the spirit of the law, right? Prime example, the Sabbath. They were so upset at Jesus when he walked this earth because his guys didn't keep the Sabbath, right? They were walking through the field and they ate from the stocks on the Sabbath. Oh, that's wrong. You've broken the Sabbath. And what does Jesus tell them? You've got this completely backwards, Man was not created for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for man. But you guys have got the cart before the horse. So the law had become a system of do's and don'ts, 633 positive commandments, 200 or whatever it is, number of negative commandments, the do's and don'ts of Judaism. And Jesus said, you guys completely missed the point. And this was his point. You know, you said you shall... Um, I can't, I'm just do a blank. You shall not murder, but he that looks at his brother with hatred in his heart is already, he's already guilty of these things. Jesus was saying, this was the spirit of what God was written when he said, thou shalt not murder. You see? It's, so it's, 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 it's not the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law. 
It's the spirit of what God had presented to us that was significant. But the religious, as they've always done and will always do, have taken it and made it a rule of, uh, or a set of, of particular obligations. To the point where now, you know, even in some circles, if you don't tithe within a certain amount of period, they're knocking on your door asking you why you're not tithing. They're asking you why you're not showing up for this meeting or for that meeting. Um, you know, it just we it just goes on and on. And of course, in all of the religious, uh, in all of the religious realm, even within the Christian framework, because make sure make sure you understand, I'm not picking on just cults, quote unquote. I'm picking on Christianity as a whole because Christianity is guilty of the same dang thing, right? Um, man, let me tell you, and, and I'm not picking on these people. It was necessary for me, and it was a good thing that God had. But you, I don't know if you're, you guys are familiar with independent fundamental Baptists. But holy smokes. I mean, they wouldn't let me do anything after I became a believer because I still had my long hair from my rock and roll days. And they told me I couldn't do anything until I cut my hair. Folks, that's religion. But it's Baptist. But it's religion. It's the same thing. When you start putting requirements on people that want to serve the Lord, based on your definition, you become religious. It doesn't matter what title is after your name. It, we can go on and on and on. You get the idea. And that's why we don't do it there. And if you don't do it their way and stuff, this is what religion always leads to excommunication. You don't do it our way, we're cutting you off. We're going to excommunicate with you. We're going to set you off and turn you on out into the devil because after all, that's what Paul said. <laughs> Funny they forgot about the Paul says, when the righteousness. Uh, uh, the the redeemed will always love the religious. Can you explain that? Well, because we, because we understand the religious are, are, are like this, and we're told to love those that hurt, persecute and hate us. So we're going to love them in spite of their judgment against us. We, we don't have an option. We have to do what Jesus did, right? So even though the religious will judge us, and criticize and analyze and all the other eyes. Well, they'll do all of that stuff with us. The one requirement that we have is to love as the Lord Jesus loved. See? So we don't, we don't get to practice hatred towards Islam who would like to wipe us from the face of the earth. That's not an option for you and I. We're like, we're supposed to follow Christ. Right? So we don't have the option of hating Muslims. We just don't have that option. We can't do that. Now we can point out where their issues are which is what I was trying to do Sunday, and apparently we'll be doing part two next Sunday. Um, but uh, um, but to, to love these people, to pray for them, to want the best for them, to give our lives for them if called to do so, that's not optional. So that's what I, that's what I mean by that. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, the, the bottom line is, look, who's the, who's the focus of all this? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, end of story. Uh, it isn't about some, some person in some position, whether it's a pope or whether it's a, a bishop or whether it's a whatever, a pastor. It, it makes no difference. The standard is not any of those people, not a rabbi or any of those. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. End of story. That's the example that he left for us. And, you know, you guys have heard me say the concept of redemption, of course, is what Jesus taught us. And on the last night of his life, the last thing that he does before he goes and is arrested, never to talk to these guys in the physical realm again, what is the last example he left them? Huh? He washed their dang filthy feet. That's the example he left. Well, you would think he knows he's leaving that room and going to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knows basically all hell is going to break loose, literally. He understands that. So you would think he would have just been giving him the old pep talk. Come on now, boys. You got to stay tough. You got to keep your head up. You got to, you know, you got to continue to put one, because this is what I would do. You know, you got to stay in the game. Don't let them get you down. Don't let them do this, you know. You got to stay faithful in the word. You got to stay faithful in prayer and worship and join all the Bible studies and all of this stuff. And that's what we would have done if it was our last night to encourage those around us, wouldn't we? But Jesus' last thing is he washes the feet. And Peter said, absolutely not. This, I'm not letting you do this. And Jesus said, dude, if you don't let me do this, you don't have any part of what I'm doing. Now, you would think that we would understand that. The quote-unquote Christian church would understand that. That these other people, I mean, he, he disrobed for these guys and he washed their feet. Uh, these are feet that walk streets where there were horse apples everywhere, right? You get the idea. You know, that's what it was like then. It's not like today the guy slips off his Nikes and you wash his feet. They may stink a little bit, 
but they don't have the God. That's what we're talking about here. This is what he did. This is the final example. Does that sound religious to you? It's completely opposite of what we have turned it into. It's just the world's going to know you if you love one another. And we take that so casually. Oh, you just love one another. And then, or sometimes we take it to the extreme. Well, all that's necessary is to love. No, no, there are things to do as well. You know, but the point is, of all of the things, the, that was so anti-religious, it wasn't even funny. And who was it that was going to arrest him just a few hours later? The religious. That's who it was. And then, of course, they would, the religious would turn him over to the politicians of Rome and the military of Rome who had their own religion because Caesar was God and the, the thing was he's claiming to be God and only Caesar is God and you got this whole thing. I mean, it's just... It's just ridiculous. So this is religion. If you want to understand religion, you have to understand Cain and Abel. And when you understand Cain and Abel, based on this stuff that we've just got through talking about, you can pinpoint it. And the, the religious will never, ever tolerate the redeemed. You're going to have to get over it. Never. So, so the fundamentalists, the, the cults, all of this stuff will continue to call us Satan. They'll continue to call us uh, you know, weak Christians, if we're Christians at all. And they'll debate whether or not you should speak in tongues and the role of women in the church and the role of the gifts of the Spirit in the church. And they'll fight over all of this stupid stuff instead of just being what Jesus asked us to be. You know, go ahead, yeah. Right. So at the Cain and Abel stage, that's when the emotion everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because what we read, when we read the passage there, Cain was a really unhappy individual. I, I mean, we, there's no way for us to know why. Was he upset because he was a farmer? Whereas, you know, I mean, he's got to till the ground, which the farmer does. He's got to water. He's got to weed. He's got to watch. He's got to wait. And then he's got to harvest. And then he's got to pack it all up. And he's got to haul it all off. Was, you know, what, is, what does Abel do? He follows the stupid sheep around. Oh, look, there's another so baby sheep, lamb. Beginning, that's when our emotions yeah, beginning. yeah. That's exactly right. And remember, right out of the garden, this, there's spiritual death into the picture because man being separated from God because of sin spiritually dies. He, he no longer has the ability to communicate clearly with God, because which is what the Spirit does, which is why we need to be born again, right? So immediately you start to see this played out, and that's the significance of, of Cain and Abel being in Adam's image versus being in God's image. Because they're coming into the picture not having that spiritual idea, even though God speaks to him, you would think that would be, it'd be pretty clear. I mean, now how does God speak? To him? I don't know. Did God actually appear and speak to him? We don't know. All we know is it said God made it very clear to him. And later, of course, it's like, where's your brother? There's another opportunity to come clean, just like his father and mother. What is this you've done? You know, oh, well, what am I, my brother must keep on again. Off goes. It's just, yeah, so the, so whatever happened, Cain's emotions, for whatever reason, whether he hated being a farmer or he just determined that, that what he was doing was significant and God should accept, we just don't know. But yeah, you're exactly right. That's where it starts to play out. And good grief, you can look at the, throughout world history and see this over and over. You can watch it in your kids, man. Right? You know? Yeah. It appears to me that it's pride and jealousy that's Sure, it's at the root of it. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. He, he doesn't have anything to do with it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. The, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it put, you know, and if you think about it, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, you can sort of understand. So, I, so I'm doing all of this stuff and you stinking sheep are eating it. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about this, so it's, it's easy to understand why he may have. Now, is that why? We, we don't know. Uh, we're, we're totally making an assumption here, but it makes sense. 
I mean, you know, it's, it's easy to be ticked off by the guy who's, you know, sits in an air-conditioned office all day when you're bent over the hood of a car and it's 120 outside and the thing just pulled off of a freeway. Trust me, I know, because when I was a mechanic, and I hated that. You know, here I am, this guy just pulls off the car, he's got a blown radiator hose, I'm bending over the hood of his car, it's 120 on, he blew a radiator hose with hot cooling all over the heat from the engine, and i got to fix this stupid radiator hose. And I think about my brother calling and saying, hey, let's do lunch. <laughs> Seriously, man? Why? How is this fair? You know, now I'm the guy saying, "Hey, let's do lunch," <laughs> and I do it every chance I get. <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, exactly. So, so you know, it's it's not hard to understand. Now, again, do we know that? No, we don't. Whatever it was, something changed in Cain that he said, "I'm no longer going to do it God's way." Okay, I'm going to do it my way, and God will accept me. And God said, "No, I won't." So that's ultimately what's going on. So Abel was not accepted by God for being a shepherd. This is the reason I put this in here. Because remember, this whole study, I was talking about this stuff to the guys in Africa. And I didn't have it in the form that you have it. We were just talking. And they asked me, these are the, these are the responses to their questions that they had. And when they finally said, you need to put this into, they called it a manual. When you put the manual, that's what you have in your laps is the manual that I put together during those four weeks I was teaching these guys. That's what I did. So this was in there because that was a question. And the guy that brought this forward was one of the pastors. And he was adamant. I mean, he really was that, well, and this, you know, uh, Cain was not accepted because he was a farmer, you know. And I was like, whoa, Abel was because he was a sheep. And so if we want to be accepted for God, we got to be a shepherd. And I was like, whoa, 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 horsey. No, 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 no. This has nothing to do with who you are. So we went through this whole process, Hummery. We just went through this and talked through this stuff and worked this out. And I said, if that's true, then I said, how is it that I'm standing here before you? I was never a shepherd. I told them about being a mechanic, because they would understand mechanic. I could tell them about being a miner. They wouldn't have got that. But so I talked about that. I said, so are you saying that all of the years that I pastored a church while I was working under the hood of a car, the first two years of this church, for example, over at Riverside Auto, was I not right with God because I wasn't out chasing the sheep? I mean, really, do you really want to say that? And so he was like, Oh, well, I, oh no. so that's why this was in there. So Abel was not accepted by God for being a shepherd, and Cain was not rejected for being a farmer. Okay? They weren't. That's why that's in there. Remember, <laughs> this is to those guys, because I had this when I finished this, the, uh, 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 the one of the boys there uh, who could speak English translated it into their language, so I wanted to make sure he got this. Remember, it is not the occupation that matters. It is the offering. That's why that's in there, because those guys, you know. In fact, this led to something that I really feel bad about. We talked about this. They kept asking, because believe it or not, they don't have any of this stuff, but they all have cell phones. It's like, it's like insane. And they all will go on to YouTube and stuff. And they always asked me a lot of times, Vitor and all the guys, you should put classes on so we can go on and... and listen to the class and have a place where, I mean, these guys, they don't get anything. They don't have running water, they don't have electricity, they have no toilets, they don't have anything, but they have a cell phone. And they're telling me this. They had a better understanding of this than I do. Ask Richard, I don't get any of this stuff. So they said, well, you know, if you did a class like this and had this set up where you teach the class, and then we could write questions, and then you could answer the questions. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I'll have to talk to someone about that. <laughs> So I actually, Marie and I were talking about this a lot, and I, was, I had this grandiose vision of doing that very thing, which is part of what we're doing by recording this. That's where I'd like to eventually get it. It just took me a couple of years to do it, to where this is available f for people to do that. The problem is, I don't know how to do any of that. I just don't know how to do it. So, you know, I don't even know how to do the Facebook thing. My daughter makes fun of me every time. So, but uh, that's what that's all about. So just, you know, throwing out a little stuff there. So you can see here, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, Cain, religion. Notice that it's that the, the point of this is he's trying to work 
into the character of God. That's the point. What he's trying to do is make his way to God. And again, that's what religious does. That's why you can only sing these songs, you can only wear these clothes, you can only read this Bible, you can only, you know, read these prayers, da -da 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 -da, and on and on it goes. You get the idea. But notice that the, the Trinity, the triune God, comes in redemption. He comes to us. That's the difference. And that really sums up the difference between Cain and Abel and religion versus redemption, really. And there's one more. Oh, there's, there's another chart. I thought well, maybe it's coming up. Here's a little, little stair one coming up somewhere. No? I must have changed it for that one there. Anyway. So here, we, here again, you know, this is just another comparison. You can see here I'm trying to drive a point home. I wanted them to make sure that they didn't misunderstand this. And that's why I'm belaboring the point here. But we're doing it, so we might as well. So religion... Versus redemption. I will make my way to God. Redemption, God has made his way to me. My book, Songs, Close, For God So Loved the World. This was really cool. I loved when God gave this to me because then when I was thinking about this, I'm thinking, in, how would you explain this from a scripture? I'm trying to think of all these different verses. And John 3.16 just popped into my head. And I'm like, oh, look at this. This is explaining everything. So I will go to God on my own effort, the work of my hands. But in redemption, no, God will come to me by his effort. He gave his only begotten son. I will go to God on my terms, my religion, prayer, ceremonies. But God has come to me on his term. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. This will be rejected. This will be accepted. Okay? So now we move into the, uh, you know, from that, you can see now, and this is the reason I'm doing this for those guys as well as for all of us, is you can understand now, because now you have chapter 5, obviously, that comes before chapter 6. Chapter 5 is that verse, and maybe next week I'll try to put this together. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. The, the, uh, for those of you that are on Wednesday nights, you'll, you'll, you know we've talked about this. But when you come to Genesis chapter 5, you've got what we call the genealogy of Adam. Okay? So it's, you know, Adam begat, and that's where all the begats come, right? Adam begat Abel, and, I'm sorry, um, um, Seth, and Seth begat, da -da -da -da, and it just moves on down the line. Well, what you don't understand when you look at it in the English is that God has laid out the plan of redemption in Genesis chapter 5. Because those names all mean something. So in other words, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about this more next week when I bring this because it's going to fit right in where we're going to go next week. But what, you, what we have to understand, we say a name, Rick, or we say the name Adam, and we just think of a name. Right? But when they said Adam, when they called him Adam, they weren't calling him a name. It was a title. They were saying, man. That's what they were saying. Think of it this way. We know from the Indians, you know, and stuff when, when we came in here and stole their land. But we know the, the, what, what were their names. Sitting bull. Standing cow. I don't know. You get the idea, right? He who walks backwards. She walks with a clenched fist. Now, there was a specific word that meant all of these things. But those words meant this. We didn't call the guy, he's what you what? We called him Sitting Bull, right? Um, so it's the same principle. So you have to understand when you read those names that we see Seth, um, we, see, uh, uh, you know, we see Adam, and we see a name, but they saw a man. They saw Seth, they saw appointed. Seth was the appointed one because he filled in for Abel, okay? Um, and then it goes on, and, and each of those names, when you break it down, tells the story of redemption. And it only works in the Hebrew language. It doesn't work in any other language. God's plan of redemption. So between chapter 4 with this concept of Cain and Abel, religion versus redemption, now you have God's plan of redemption reinforced in chapter 5, and then you move into chapter 6 with Noah. Okay, do you guys have chapter 6? Do you have this slide? Okay, all right. I wasn't sure how, much, how many I put down there. So we don't, so, so what that's telling us is, is the, the consequences of sin, which are clearly evident in chapter 4 with the Cain and Abel factor, right? Those things just continue to get passed in. So God inserts the plan of redemption in chapter 5, and then we get to chapter 6 with Noah, we find out just how bad things have gotten. The consequences of sin are devastating. Absolutely devastating. And it's funny because we have this concept that if we're going to do something really stupid, which we would call sin, right, and be disobedient to God, there's a, there's a tendency in us to say, well, 
you know, if I do this, I, I'm willing to pay the price. The problem is, it ain't just you that's going to pay the price. We never sin alone. There are no Rambos when it comes to sin. It affects every single aspect of our lives and every single person in our lives, right? So the consequence of Cain's sin and, and Abel and, and the, the growth and the necessity of reaffirming the plan of redemption has reached its culmination when we come to Genesis chapter 6. Now I will say that uh, I, I don't want to get into too much of this because we could have some real fun here. But if you've never read Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, you should read them. Because they will freak you right on out. Because something is happening there. This is the sons of God passage. Revelation, or Revelation. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. I'm currently doing a massive study on that and chasing it down by some of the apocryphal books, Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees, and comparing them with you know, the, the, the scripture. And it is unbelievable what's going on there. Because there was a, what you find, what you discover, and again, I don't want to belabor the point because that's a huge study of its own accord, um, but one I think that, you know, is, uh, uh, people need to understand, um, that th what was ultimately happening there is that there was an attempt in the supernatural realm to change the genetic order of man. Okay, that's what you find when you go through all of this especially when you read it in the original language, in the Hebrew. The English, it just looks like, well, who these sons of gods are and the daughter of men, and you can go on and on with that. Well, who are these people? What are they? Blah, blah, blah. But whatever it was, is you cannot come to the fact that the result of whatever that union was were something that were abnormal. It's that simple. There is no other conclusion to come to, period. You can dance around all you want. It clearly says something happened. Somehow the supernatural made an attempt to pollute the gene pool. Why? To stop the Messiah. To stop the seed of the woman. And God said, uh, no. And what you find is the results from verses 1 to 4, because from, from basically it starts in Lamech, with one of the, in that line of Adam, he's the, uh, uh, I think he's the, I can't remember what he is. He's, he's, the great, he's the grandfather of Enoch. But anyway, um, in the days of Lamech, you find out that things got really, really bad. And this supernatural attempt, and it polluted the earth. And the, the attempt in the gene pool with these things called the Nephilim, which we'll leave that again for another time. But the result of that is it plays out. Because you've got to remember, there's, there's you know, a thousand years between these two incidents. We look at from one chapter to the next without realizing the amount of time that was involved. So things had gotten really out of hand. Okay? So knowing that little bit of background now, and it is, touch, believe me, we just touched on it, but basically uh, what, what you have here, oh my gosh. Okay, let me, let me have some fun here, just for, the, just for a second. What you find is the, this word, which we get giants from, the Greek, gigantes, okay? What you find when you go back and you study, because remember, the Hebrew was translated into Greek 285 B.C., right? When Alexander conquered the world, he made everybody speak Greek. So the Hebrews, the people started to speak Greek, and they were losing their language. So nobody could read God's word in Hebrew anymore. So there was an attempt by 70 scholars, not an attempt, they did. They translated the Hebrew into the Greek. It's called the Septuagint, okay, in 285 B.C. When Jesus quotes, that's what he's quoting, okay? Sometimes he will quote the Hebrew, but he's typically quoting the Septuagint. So when that Septuagint came in, and those guys came along, and they saw this concept of Nephilim, the fallen ones, and talked about giants, and this, this, this unique mix between supernatural and natural, with the genetic, messing with the genetics there, um, with the gene pool, what you end up finding is they inserted the word for these guys as gigantes, which we translate into giants. Okay. The problem is what gigantes ultimately meant, because it comes down, and it, there's so much to this, but as it, it, terms of, it comes down to ultimately mean to those guys when they translated it, what we would call titans. The titans. We just have movies. The Clash of the Titans. What are the titans? They're called demigods. They're a mixture of the supernatural with the natural. And Greek mythology is full of these things. 
So when you come to this whole concept, what you begin to understand, and even the Greeks picked up on, and the, the use of the Greek language when they translated into this, was something, whatever happened in Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4, changed everything. And there were these supernatural, natural beings that came out of it. The, the offspring was not normal, and God said no. So this plays itself out until Noah's time. And it had gotten to a point by Noah's time because people were starting to want to interact with these beings, creatures, whatever you want to call them, more than they were wanting to react with God. By the way, in Sodom and Gomorrah, when you read the concept of Sodom and Gomorrah and the guys are banging on the house to, to ask Lot to send out the two angels, again, in the English you don't pick this up, but in the original language you will discover they knew they were angels and they wanted to have relationships with angels. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah is about. It was about homosexuality. That was a part of it. But that wasn't the reason God... Homosexuals, homosexuality has been a problem for man forever. God never brought the heavens down on him for it. So what the heck was going on here? Again, it was an attempt with the supernatural. And so God, the two times God brings his judgment, in both instances, there's an attempt uh, to, to mess with the gene pool between the, the, the supernatural and the natural, the physical and the, and the spiritual. Both times. It's the only time he ever did that. Rained fire down from heaven and brought water from the heavens. The only two times he ever did it was in the tampering with the gene pool. And he said, no, everything after its kind, remember? You know, period. So all of that is leading up. That's all the stuff that was happening in verse 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. He was seeking this supernatural thing. And if you think, well, that just sounds crazy. I don't think I believe that. Well, look around you. What is happening in the world today? Have you noticed the fascination with all the programs on TV about the ghost hunters? Why do you think that's all happening? We could go on and on. I don't want to belabor the point. You get the idea. So what was going on then is going on now. People are fascinated with this and are committed to engaging this. Call it a seance. Call it necromancy. Call it whatever you want to call it. What is that? It's an attempt to join the supernatural with the natural. It's nothing new. It's been going on since these days. But God saw this was all they wanted to do. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. Why beast, man and beast? Because not only you learn from Enoch and these other things, not only were they tampering with the supernatural and the natural, the, the spiritual world or the physical world, they had brought in the animals as well. And we're attempting to pollute the gene pool in the animals. Think of what's that dude's name, that, that Greek one that's a half goat, half man? What's his name? Um, plays the flute. Pan. Pan. Think of the guy that's half a horse and half a man. Gee, wonder where that comes from. Those guys just made it up? Really? Maybe it was passed down to him. Who knows? Anyway, you get the idea. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the old rabbis prior to just after Jesus' time, you could go back and you can still read their writings and they all believe that the reason Noah found grace because he was he and his family were the only ones that hadn't been polluted by this stuff that we're talking about and that's what's being described here it wasn't just that he was a good dude okay now you can go on and on but you get the idea so all the people of the world had gone by the way had gone the way of Cain it had gotten so bad that they put aside God's intention in marriage by taking more, more, more than one wife. And we see that polygamy enters into the picture in Genesis chapter 4, verses 19 to 22. They even wrote poems about sin of murder. There's two lines. There's the line of Cain. There's the line of Adam. And both have a Lamech. Okay. The Lamech in the line of Cain uh, is this the, the one that's the written poems about the sin of murder. Oh, if Cain was, you know, done this for, the, you know, why, come to me, wives, for I have done this great thing. If, at, or if Cain is punished, then I will be because I have killed more men than him. So they were writing poems about killing the very thing that God had said. Remember, sin lies at the door and its desires to have you. 
Anyway, so Noah was a descendant of Seth, the son born in place of Abel. There, he would have been the only one to still trust in his God. And of course, now as I'm studying more, uh, if these guys are correct, that he he was the only one that had his gene pool had remained pure. For this reason, he found grace, favor, kindness in the sight of the Lord because of God's grace. Noah and his family would be spared the judgment of God, which would be the flood. Okay, pretty much that's all that you know that I had there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's interesting because some of the Hebrew guys that I'm reading, the rabbis and stuff, they they talk about the fact that we, you know, we know that the God sent to the animals two by two, and and we know we understand so that they could procreate, obviously. But they 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 it follows in the same line that in the animal kingdom, remember the the attempt in the supernatural was to pervert the gene pool. In other words, create the creation is what it to pervert the creation of God, and so that the animals that God brought to Noah, including the seven clean animals pre-law, by the way, but the, but they were all animals that had not been tampered with. Yeah, clean genetically, absolutely. Yeah. So then, that's why none of them, didn't any of the other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds so harsh. I mean, why didn't God change some hearts and have, you know, 100 people show up? You know, because again, the belief is that, and Enoch, and you, I'm telling you, you, you guys, you guys got to read this stuff. It's mind boggling. And you have to remember, because we live in a day, we live in a day where, and it's true. I mean, we have the, what we call the canon of scripture, right? So we would call Enoch and Jasher and, and Jubilees and other books, but, but those in particular, we would, we, we call them apocrypha because they're not quote unquote part of the canon. But when you start reading these, you start looking at them. Now, this doesn't apply to like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gnostic Gospel or the Book of Abraham and, you know, all of these others because they, they go off of what the, the, the word as we have it says. But Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees do not. They do not contradict the scripture in any way. And the other thing to remember, and this is why the rabbis, um, they counted this. In fact, the Ethiopian church still considers Enoch as part of their canon. We don't, but they do. But what you find is that, uh, you, you know, the reason they did that, because there's two times in the book of Samuel and one in Joshua where the phrase is written as it is written in the book of Jasher. So the Bible is quoting this other book as if it was Bible. As if it was in, an, as, as, it, as Isaiah the prophet said, it's, it's given equal footing. So, so then it's the same with, of course, in Jude. Jude quotes Enoch. Jubilees. Yeah. Man, and, and Enoch will blow your doors off. We all know about Enoch. He was the one that was raptured, right? And he gives us the whole account in there when he's writing. And, it's, and when you get to Jasher, Jasher tells us that Noah, that that book was passed on from Enoch to Methuselah to Noah, and Noah passed it on to his sons. The book of Jubilees tells us that. And he tells this, his son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, after the flood, we're going to get into that nations next week, he tells them about these books and why they're significant. So it, and so the question then comes, well, why doesn't Enoch and Jasher, in particular, they're the only two that I would, not that anything wrong with Jubilees in the sense that it, it doesn't divert from the scripture, but because those two books are called on within the scripture, there's reference to them within the scripture itself, I would give them a little higher up. Now, I'm not going to call them canon because, I don't, because I've grown up saying you can. But it is very interesting. And what you find is the first time that Enoch is removed from what the rabbis were reading is after Jesus. After Jesus was crucified in the claim of the resurrection. You follow this all back. And then you say, well, why? Because in the book of Enoch, Enoch is called. He's called up into heaven. And guess who he sees in heaven? Messiah. And who was Messiah? This is Enoch. This is before, Ab before Noah. But he describes Jesus Christ in the days of the Jews. So th the belief is that those rabbis kept it out because... They knew it was pointing to Yeshua. Oh yeah, Enoch was written before Noah. Yeah, before the flood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, because it go, because of the because of the lang, the uh, the writing on the Wednesday class. Remember, we talked about the Paleo Hebrew and all that stuff, because it's written back there, and there are copies of that found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which people don't want to tell us for some reason. Imagine that. But anyway, I don't want to make a big thing out of this. But I'm telling you, if you read Enoch, you're going to go, oh my gosh. And the church, then, why doesn't the church put it into the canon? Well, because in the fourth century, um, there was all of this issues with uh, some of the religions, Christian religions, and we talked about it Sunday with Gnosticism and all the connection with the angels and the angels deliver a new revelation. Well, it's all talking about all of this stuff. So the belief is that they kept it out because they were trying to get away from saying the angels did anything. And Enoch is full of the angels saying all kinds of stuff. There's Michael and Gabriel in there doing all kinds of stuff. They're asking God in Enoch. This is so cool. They actually, Michael is ticked over what Lucifer, actually it's not Lucifer, Samaja is the guy's name, but under Lucifer, Lucifer said, hey, you guys should go do this. There's 200 of them, by the way. They're called the Watchers in the book of Enoch. 200 Watchers, which, by the way, show up in Daniel. And uh, anyway, it just goes on and on. And what ends up happening is Michael goes before the throne of God, and he's talking to God, and he said, this is Rick paraphrase, you need to let me go kick the crap out of those guys. And God says, they're going to get theirs. And so he doesn't use Michael. They, the angels, the judgment is passed on them, Samaria and these other guys, the head guy. Um, and he, they realize what's going to happen and that the angels can't help them. So they go to Enoch. And they make a request to Enoch to take a request before God to not judge them for this thing. And God says, you go back and you tell him, absolutely not. When judgment comes, he is going to be reserved in darkness unto judgment. That's exactly what Jude tells us. That those guys, there's a certain group of angels that are kept that did something that was beyond what other angels have done. That's part in the dead, some of the front, all of that stuff. And it was kept out of the Bible. The belief is because the, the, the angel thing and because people, we didn't want them to think we were weird Christians believing in these supernatural things. And yet it surrounds us everywhere in Greek mythology and elsewhere. It's, it's crazy. So it's just, it's fun. I'm telling you, it bogs. I'm putting together now a deal where I, the scripture and then all of the references that talk about that scripture in these books, you know, of course, given precedent to the scripture. But it, so it's so you can read the scripture and then read what these other guys, all these other writings are talking about this. And it's, man, what a pain it is. But it's, it's really cool. I'm having a blast. So I just said I wasn't going to get into all this, but it's really fun. One last thing. We were talking about this. I think it was Daniel 242, I think it was, um, where, where it says to the effect, you can read this. Um, that in the last days, that you know, the toes of the image of Nebuchadnezzar with the, the clay and the iron. If you read that carefully, the first time this was shown to me, I had read this a hundred times. I taught, and this person showed this to me, and I, was, I, I literally was stunned because I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I knew who Enoch was. I hadn't never studied or read it or anything. But it says in there, they will attempt to mix with the seed of men, but they will not adhere. And I looked at that and I'm like, oh my gosh. So the last days on earth, there's going to be another attempt for whatever this is described there to mix with the seed of men. People say, well, it's religion or it's Judaism and Christianity or it's Islam with Romanism or it's... Really? Those things have always mixed. So something is being described here which is weird. Something that's happening again. Again, I would alert you to the fascination with the supernatural once again. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> Charmed. We got all of these things. We just pass them off as goofy movies. But what's going on here? What's really happening? What is the attempt with, what's the problem with cloning? What is the problem with cloning? It's manipulating the genetic order. End of story. So it's just, wow. Wow. Where did all this come from? So we could have, we could go on and on and on, but I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> so having fun. What we have is the scripture. Trust the scripture. But don't be blind to this other stuff because it is fascinating and it sure does make a lot of sense. But scripture is scripture. That's the way it is. That's all we need. We don't need anything else. Wow, it's really cool to see this other stuff. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thanks for this evening.